levels, like right now we would be doing from 5.2 up to you know, 6.11. And you can have the same probes with the same arguments, and we're trying to do it in a way that you don't have to worry about the facts, what's under the covers and how we get those. Um, but I primarily want to talk about you know, how we get there. So, like I said, we're defining this set of semantic probes. They were already defined, they're already documented, we didn't have anything to do, to do, to do there. And then figuring out um, that when the semantic event is reported, it will show as a probe firing, and that we can get the arguments. And that sounds very easy, and that turned out to be a lot more complicated than we ever thought. So this is a little example um, for an I.O. probe. So the, the concept of this probe, and again, on the, the semantic meaning behind it is that this should fire when an I.O. event completes, um, which can happen in very many different ways. So uh, in this particular case, in order to support it on this wider range of, of kernels, we have to use different kind of underlying probes. And so whenever these of, any of these probes fires, we have to um, make it appear to the user that it's this more semantic probe. So we have to do a lot of reshuffling of argument values and um, work with whenever things are going to be fired, um, how that works. And then we have NFS, what pops in there, and there's you know one of the raw uh, trace points, the two of them, that are specific to NFS. They don't have a biostruct, which we have for all the other um, I.O. events. So there we have to actually create one. And that is you know one of the things that adds to the complexity of having to do this. Uh, because it's, it's not as straightforward as just attach a program to a probe, get results back, and start processing. In other cases, and this is where, for instance, you're waiting for I.O., and you want to know when, it's, when you started waiting, when you stopped waiting. So this is when we stopped waiting. We actually have to use multiple probes in order to make this work together. Uh, in this case, it's fairly easy. Uh, we can set a probe at the beginning of the function, set a probe at the end, for the submit by our weight. And the reason why we have to do it is because by the time we get to the end of the function, which is when the wait is over, we no longer know what we were waiting for because we just get a return value. We don't have access at that moment to um, the original values, although now that we have made some underlying changes, we actually can do it um, thanks to some, some improvements that were made in BPF uh, with the helpers. Um, now for XFS, in this case, that is kind of the odd child out. We have to use a different probe, and again, we have to do this faking of, of a bio that we don't have at that point. So there is a lot of underlying work that needs to be done. So that's a lot of opportunity for common code as well, and that's kind of the bulk of, of what we're looking at for this. Uh, there's essentially almost an infrastructure we have to build to make this all work, because we don't want to have custom programs for every single probe. So there's a lot of opportunity for common code, and it's also a good scenario for pre-compiled BPF code, because since all the probing programs are BPF programs, uh, is there common code that is not dependent on, on things, for instance, um, of the, the actual session, there's more underlying functions that we can use. If we can pre-compile those, they can just be linked in with our program when we want to do the probing. So that's where we've been able to leverage uh, the BBF support in GCC and in binutils quite a lot. So then DTrace itself has its own built-in compiler to compile the tracing scripts into BBF code and the linker to you know, put them all together. And I'll get to that in a couple more slides. Now, one problem we've run into, and this is kind of the first, uh, not sure what to do about it yet, is it would be ideal if we could have BBF functions that we can load into the kernel that can be shared by all these different BPF programs. Because our BPF programs for tracing can become pretty big. Um, you know, definitely in the area of thousands of instructions. And um, it would just be nice if there was a way to, to handle this. Um, so far, the only thing that I'd looked at um, that seemed possibly promising was um, the program type extensions where you can um, basically build a program and, and, and attach it, 
uh, but it has, it has severe limitations on um, what you can do with those in terms of what arguments can be passed and what you can return. So that didn't seem very viable. Um, so more generic code can also be challenging for BPF uh, in general. And it also makes the tool chain more challenging in the sense that if it's generic code, it kind of somewhat goes against the ability of the BPF verifier sometimes of being able to guarantee that this code is safe. And so we have to add uh, various hints to the code to make it clear that you know, there are certain boundaries uh, to make it possible that it can pass the verifier. Um, but then compiler optimization in, in pre-compilation can remove those again as making the determination from the compiler side that while well, these conditionals you put in the code are, un not, are unnecessary, they don't do anything. So we've had to play with that a little bit to um, essentially force that those hints remain in place that we don't run into trouble. Um, loops are still somewhat challenging um, because again, it needs to be able to be proven to the B PPF verifier that it can determine that the loop uh, is bound sufficiently. And a recent one we ran into is stack use and the stack has been um, doubled, used to be 512, now it's uh, 1024, but we still can run into that fairly easily by f because of the fact that we use these generic functions that are being put together. And so the chain of calls that are being made within the BPF program can really start adding up. And so we ran into that when uh, we wrote one of those very generic pieces of code that had to put some data aside, so it was storing it on the stack, so it could you know, make uh, an additional call, and um, that was just enough to push it over the limit. So um, that's still a, a bit of a, uh, an issue to work with, um, and there's ways around it. And you know, we can, like in this case, you know, we have a map set aside where we can store the temporary data, things like that, but it kind of goes a little bit against the just being able to write the function and use a local variable and have the local variable not basically be what makes my BPF program not pass the verifier because we're blowing the stack. Um, so we have our custom compilers completely self-contained within D-Trace um, because D, which is kind of the language that's um, the tracing programs are expressed in, is very well defined. And it means that all compilation can be done on the fly. That means that we also don't have to deal with um, core um, complexities, which is all fully supported by the tool chain. And obviously, um, a lot of other support for that uh, is done in BPF, but we just don't have to need it. We don't need it. There is, we never save BPF programs as objects. So uh, that's at least one complication we uh, could avoid. And then we have this custom linker which is taking the code that has been compiled on the fly, that is our tracing scripts, and links it with pre-compiled code and basically creates the BPF programs out of that. So that uh, creates quite a... Is, is there any reason why not using LD there? Um, because we have some linking support in LD for BPF. Mainly because for the next thing, the re relocation uh, resolving that we do, um, there is a lot of relocation that needs to happen where certain constants that have not been calculated until the very last minute that need to be inserted into various instructions. So it would be no good to know if the existing BPF relocations, which are only a few of them, would be enough to cover your needs here. Yeah, I mean, we probably could. Like, I understand yeah. this does it on the fly, but you could get mm -hmm. the on the fly code generated by the decompiler, put it in an object and so how fit it to the linker. Yeah, that we might be able to do. So I can have a look at that, because that, that would be interesting. If you need additional relocations, it, it would be mm -hmm. nice to know okay. exactly what would be needed. Yeah. Okay, yeah, definitely uh, we'll, we'll have to have a look at that, because that could actually be useful, because that link, the, the custom linker is kind of one of the least favorite parts of the whole <laughs> implementation, and it's mine, so I, I guess I get to not like it. Um, so in terms of some of the um, probing issues we run into and still you know, typically do, um, when we need to probe to kernel functions, we have kind of two ways we can go right now. We, so we can either go with uh, k-probes or we can go 
with F probes, which is the F entry and F exit. So the K probes is the way we used to do it and still gets done for older kernels where we did not have um, the support for F entry and F exits. Um, but it's very hard to know if you actually can probe a function until you try. And that's kind of makes for a very bad user experience if you basically have a tracing program that seems to perfectly work, uh, compiles fine, load into the kernel, and that's when the moment things go wrong and you basically get told that you can't attach to these particular functions. Um, so we start using F entry and F exit where we can. Then it's a lot more dependable. We know which functions uh, are supported with that. Um, still runs into some limitations. So one big uh, issue, was well, not a big issue, the problem is that since it's more generic, uh, we run into it maybe a little bit more often than we would have hoped, is um, when you have a struct that is passed by value, so a struct that fits within uh, 16 bytes, um, it used to not work at all. Um, some support was added for that for x86-64. I think by now maybe ARM64, I didn't check um, before writing this slide. But there's no general support in, for, for all architectures. And so when, in that case, you have a program that attaches to a, um, a function that has one of these arguments, the BPF verifier rejects the BPF program. So, which is, again, not an ideal situation uh, in terms of user experience. That, um, and we can, we can obviously trap that, but it's, it's, it's not that nice then to be able to explain to a user, okay, you know, why did this program not work? Because um, by all indications, it should be able to. Um, there is also solutions involved with getting other arguments. Um, so one of the issues exists also in the fact that we're limited to 10 arguments, uh, depending on you know, how we're probing, which um, context we're using. But sometimes we have functions that have much more than those. So um, that is still something that we need to work on, and then it gets more complicated um, because it gets very uh, specific code. So regular trace points, um, they're already kind of semantic in nature. So the advantage for those is that you might have multiple probe points in the kernel. They all get delivered as a single trace point. So you have that, that view of, um, of seeing more functionality being traced rather than specific uh, instructions and functions. And they move with the code. So that's kind of uh, a very convenient tool for us. The arguments for those, that's where we're into that. Um, some of them have more than 10 arguments. I did a quick count. It was only uh, 54 trace points out of you know, 1,893. So it's not like there's a lot of them. But again, when we're doing something more generic, the few is the one that somebody's going to stumble over and going to complain that this does not work. So um, that is still something we're trying to work on how to fix that especially because, again, if you're working with a tool that is supposed to be able to work on a wider range of kernels, you're dealing with all these different versions, um, you might end up with a, a whole bunch of different implementations to do the same thing to be able to support that. Um, so once we have to implement retrie retrieving arguments ourselves, again, that is um, a much more complicated thing to do, uh, becomes architecturally independent and more likely to break. Is that, yep, there's what I got. So that's where uh, I am got to at this point with presenting this. So the biggest problems that I'm trying to look for solutions for is um, primarily the issues with, for instance, running over the stack. And um, just in general, the concept of having generic functions in the kernel, that is something that um, I know it has been discussed for several years in, uh, in the realm of, of BPF, but if I don't know if anybody has um, any experience with that or might have any suggestions on how to best do that, or whether it's even a wanted feature that can be explored further, um, that would be a very big help. So for the stack usage, what 
in practice people do, they use per CPU map as a like temporary scratch space, which gives you up to 32 yeah. kilobytes. Yeah, and that's one of the things I've wanted to explore that because again, when we're dealing with the pre-compiled code, we're kind of leaving it up to the compiler to obviously uh, allocate memory for local variables, which is where uh, most of the stack usage seems to be going to. So um, I guess the only solution there would be if the compiler can somehow automatically do this, which I'm not sure that would be. By, by compiler, you mean like your custom D? No, it'd be D like language? TCC or LLVM and such. Okay. <laughs> Okay, if you're working on that, what, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, w working on what exactly? Did you say you are working on that? In Clang? Yeah. To do what? To put local automatics somewhere else than in the stack? Mm, how to file the stack? Basically, you allocate a chunk of the memory and use it for the stack. Uh, okay. Uh, so allocate a heap of memory and use it for the stack. Oh yeah, that's a different. But it would also solve this problem of the limitation of the main yeah. stack I get. Uh, no. No, it would not. No. So, so the f I don't think it's 1024. It's 512. Did we did we update it to to more? No, I think it's 512 oh, it's bytes. 512. 512. Okay. Yeah. And what what uh, Yong Kong said that's actually kind of like a physical stack that's being used at runtime, and if you have nested BPF program, all that stuff. So like he's solving that problem. 512 doesn't go anywhere right now, and it's actually hard to increase it because that automatically increases the size of the BPF verifier state, and like also increases the chance that like you'll need more states and use more more memory, more mm -hmm. verification, all that stuff. So you know, so it's not like just saying okay, let's do two kilobytes. It, it has like yeah. further implications. So mm -hmm. like if you can avoid relying on like big stack space, it's better. Uh, one reason why Verifier has to keep track of all this information because it keeps track of like possible range values for the mm -hmm. register and like whether this slot is like some special pointer or not was the using of the per CPU map, right? For Verifier it's just unknown value. And so it yeah. doesn't really track it in mm -hmm. any special way. It's just like some, some random memory the reference. We just know that it's valid memory range. So, so it also helps with the verification. If you can do that, that would yeah, be Yeah, and it's, I mean, one of the reasons why we, it, it gets so uh, tricky for us because there's a lot of maps that we need to maintain references to that a BPF program needs to be able to use, you know, to get to things to a string table and such. And they all have to be on the, on the stack because once you store them in a map, they're no longer recognized as pointers to a BBF map. So that's where it gets a little more tricky. But um, so, yeah, we'll have to. Yeah, but like something like integers and like values yeah, that they, like they, you don't really need, that, that could yeah. be offloaded potentially. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that, that might be something we have to just look at then from the language perspective. And I actually had like a question about the second biggest issue you have. Like, mm -hmm. what do you mean by reusable BPF program or, or whatever was that? Um, well, for instance, I'm trying to find the uh, best example. Um, Um, well, may, maybe an example would be that so when um, in, in our tracing programs, when an error occurs, so there is uh, in D-Trace the concept of an error probe that fires. So we essentially have to kind of synthesize a probe event and that is a generic event. So it, no matter what causes the error, uh, basically there is this one BPF function we have that gets called whenever an error occurs in the BPF program and that kind of takes care of, you know, uh, synthesizing these events. So right now that function has to be linked into every single BBF program. And if you're tracing, um, but maybe a couple thousand probes, 10,000 probes, we have 10,000 copies of this function. So if it would be possible okay. to have, and we have a lot of these functions that are possibly going to pop up. So if there, if there would be a way to almost have a library of functions that can be shared by BPF programs. So, so we approached like solving that problem mm -hmm. from a different angle. Like instead of loading thousand different BPF programs for each probe, for each like function mm -hmm. that you're attaching, we actually have multi, multi K probe, which you can, you load one BPF program, then you attach it in multiple But then places. it's the same program for all the probes, right? Because all these programs are 
different yes, typically. Yes, but also we have stuff like BPF cookie where you can enter at runtime, like basically know which of the attachments it is. And like if you need some custom logic, you can actually do it in like one common program logic, basically. Okay, so you would. So like you would, you, you load BPF program that has like a switch statement, like which out of 10 different things it is, right? And like you need to do like some extra stuff, then you're like, yeah. what is the cookie, right? Like 0, 1, 2, 3, 10. Mm -hmm. And then like when you attach, you actually say, okay, this attachment is cookie 0, this attachment is cookie 1, and so on. So, so is, that way you, you have like one big it, generic is, is there a hope on a more elegant solution? Because that feels a little inelegant. So yeah, as you discussed, we discussed the uh, true sharing of the functions, global functions. And the way the global functions were added in the verifier, the whole idea was that they will be like shareable. Okay. So it's wasn't done because, well, there was no like specific use case and p people didn't work on it. But conceptually, it's not hard, even from a verifier point of view. Mm -hmm. Like it will be a global function, and just later program can say like call this global function, and it all will just work. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I assume that probably will have to be some limitations on arguments and such in there yes. to be able yeah, to yeah. verify. Yeah, yeah, the way global it. functions are verified is only based on types. Not any. Oh, and tags, sure. Yeah, but, but yeah, yeah th there are there are limitations. It's not like static. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I I would assume as long as being able to pass in map pointers for which you obviously have the types and the contexts. Um, yeah. That should yeah. be doable. Yeah, that will work. Well, patches are welcome, of course. <laughs> like, it's yeah. But that's good because that definitely that would be I think would be a great addition. And I mean, we might be one of the rare cases where this actually. <laughs> I it's don't a really big use case. It's not that rare. Like okay. people want to, let's say, like load some, mm -hmm. I don't know, hashing function once and uh, yeah. call it from everywhere, or load like tdigest and use it from like many different. So it's it's just like normal shared libraries the way they exist in user space. They need to exist in VPF land as well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Definitely. Hi. Um, I mean, providers, for me, were one of the best things about sort of at least the user interface into D-Trace, so whether it was kernel providers or USDT you know, provider definitions. Um, I, I don't think you said it in the talk. Are you saying you're actually, you know, from the, for example, the I.O. provider, and I can't off memory remember, but, you know, it's got a file info T, a dev info T, you know, it's exporting out its arguments. Are you actually populating them in Linux? Because obviously there's a lot of things there that Linux just doesn't have that was hard engineered in Solaris. Yeah. Um, Path names. They're um, populated to the best of our ability. I've got, that's going to have to put it that way. But do you, do you expose them? So you're trying to stick to that sort of s definitions, yes. are you? So the, the idea is for the, the standard providers that have been documented and have been documented for years to be able to provide those uh, with the arguments so that the translators uh, have been written for that to basically take the data that we can get out of the kernel and put them into those specific types. Okay, so you're still sticking to the translator framework and things like that? Um, yes, but it's actually a lot more convenient now because yeah. it's, you know, personally, D-Trace was kind of written that way anyway, but so it's really uh, inserting BPF code um, into the programs. That's another of those cases where we're basically reusing BPF code. Uh, but yeah, that's getting in line, so we do have that. Okay, and you've got kernel versions listed in your slides. Is that Oracle Linux kernel um, version? No, it also works on upstream kernels. So anything from 5 to upwards should be no problem. Okay. All right, thank you. Well. Uh, so I just have a question, which is... Um, uh, obviously, for older kernels, you can't help but have to do all this stuff in user space and so on and so on. But is there a plan at some point to try to, um, and I don't know if this is a contentious question, um, is there a plan to try to get some of these things to be like trace points so that from kernel version X onwards, you can just use the trace point for it? Or is that not possible? Um, there's definitely a possibility. I'm sure uh, if there are specific trace points that would be deemed to be, um, you know, by a, gr a larger uh, group of users, um, as something that would be worth adding to the kernel, um, we'd have to submit it 
submitted just as a regular uh, kernel patch in terms of you know increasing uh, or adding a group of trace points. Um, specifically, the ones that DTrace has uh, would not be the case because they're that's kind of the, the flip side of being too generic. Um, they're not specific to Linux, so I don't think they would probably be acceptable. And I probably wouldn't be promoting it myself um, because we can do what we're doing here, which is basically taking what is there and using those to present the semantic um, probes to the user. And I think that's kind of the model that we probably should try to keep working with. Uh, right, but I mean, like, for instance, let's say if you had, a, okay, so you have like the ultra generic D trace probe, but let's say yeah. you, for instance, I don't know, the, the IO example, mm -hmm. for instance, um, if you were to create a semantic but for Linux IO probe that then the DTrace for Linux would use, um, would that not be something that, I mean, I, I'm just interested in knowing whether that's um, something that you want to do. Because like, for instance, let's say, yeah. let's say that like some other file system decides to do BIOs in a weird way, you yeah. would now need to handle that and so on and like basically for the rest of time, have, well, maybe not that long, but for, for a long time have to deal with this for every single kernel yeah. version. I'm just uh, wondering whether that's something that um, um, is It's radar. something that could be considered but that would become a much, would have to definitely become a much larger discussion also with the whole tracing community if this is something that is anybody's interested in or if uh, this kind of an approach is more applicable to that. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned with kprobe, kred probe, you don't know ahead of time whether you can trace the function, right? Yes. Uh, Linux has like this special file available filter functions or whatever it's called. Like yeah. that, that doesn't work for you. No. Um, Why not? Apparently, and this is just I found this out uh, the hard way. Not all the functions listed in there. Uh, it, it, it's not possible to connect a kprobe to all of those functions. There are some of them where it's not possible. Um, F entry, F exit seems to work for everything that's I, listed. I think for kprobe there is like additionally some blacklist file, so like maybe if you subtract from... Yeah, there, there is still, still? There is yeah. still some yeah. other ones. I think it's just a matter of the way that um, list is compiled does not seem to take into consideration all the conditions that kprobe has uh, mm -hmm. to be able to place probes. Okay. And but it has to be like a rare case, right? Because like, most of the time it seems to work fine. <laughs> It, it's most of the time it works fine, except okay. when right. you okay. try to trace something. There's okay. that one function. No, it sounded like it doesn't work at all. Okay, so no, it's no, just no, like no. some some rare case. But it's, I'm, yeah, I'm, I mean, if you try to if you try to use BPF trace to like trace every K funk, that doesn't work. Like it. I mean, there's people around here who do much more BPF trace and BPF stuff than I do. But I mean, yeah, the available funks. I mean, it just has to be. I, think, I know BPF trace does some individual work in blacklisting, you know, just to say, because if you touch that, you might get sort of, you know, results you didn't want, basically hang something. Um, but yeah, I think that's it, isn't it? Look at the available functions and filter out yourself. That's what BPF trace does. Yeah, um, and, and, and right now it's basically, um, like once we, on the newer kernels where uh, F entry and F exit are available, um, that seems to be working perfectly fine with the list that is listed there, so. Um, and we're okay with that since, I mean, F entry is uh, in enough kernels that it's not going to be an issue. So yeah, that, that works. So uh, are you saying that you can attach an F entry to every function in the available uh, filter functions list? Or how are you checking which uh, functions can be attached to F entry? Um, well, I've... In the end, because I started finding that there were some with k-probes that were posing an issue, um, I basically just used a, a dtrace script that's attached to every single function that's listed and see what happened. And with k-probes, well, first of all, it takes forever with k-probes to get there. But then it, it wasn't able to. Uh, it failed on a couple of the functions. And unfortunately, it failed one and then it stopped. So I, had to, I eventually gave up trying to find out the, what the whole list would be. Uh, but w once we started using uh, F entry, F exit, that just simply worked. It does slow down the system a bit, but it worked. So, okay. anything else? Um, I'll look at it, but I kind of want to go with. <laughs> 
shared functions. Oh, for, for the speed. Well, that would be the one thing that's true, um, and that is something that I've been thinking about, and I, I should just try it out uh, since, you, since you mentioned it, that um, if, if it's a very large amount of probes that we need to work with, and especially if we have a, uh, a single program, um, that might be actually um, an architecture change that would be worthwhile to look into indeed to have the single program that attaches to the multiple ones. Because, yeah, it's... I mean, F-entry is a lot faster, but yeah, so that, that's definitely a, a great suggestion, and it's, it was on my list, but once I started using F-entry and F-exit, I kind of uh, took it aside, but that's actually a really good idea. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.